Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Oster. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Children's Health Care Atlanta and Sibley Heart Center uh, Cardiology. And it's my pleasure to speak to you about COVID-19 and the return to sports. Joining me today will be Richard Lampier, uh, a nurse who oversees our Project SAVE to tell you a little bit about that program uh, as part of this as well. So first, the relevant disclosures. Um, you know, we have no major disclosures for uh, this project. I will say, uh, uh, and I let some people know that I do some work with the CDC as well. I just want to make it clear that I'm not wearing that hat today. You can cue the pediatric cardiologist with Sibley. So we're going to go over a few things today. Um, first, uh, you know, we gave a talk back in June on multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. I'm going to give you a brief update uh, on that. Then we'll get into a little bit about COVID-19 and heart disease. What do we know and what are the concerns? Next, we'll get into some of the meat of this, which is going to be the guidelines for return to sports. There's a lot of information out there and we're learning as we're going. So we're gonna go through what we know and what we're recommending. And then finally, uh, Richard will go over Project SAVE, uh, which is an important program uh, in schools throughout Georgia. So let's start with an update on multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And what have we seen so far uh, at Children's Healthcare Atlanta? So when we last spoke, or when I gave a seminar on this in early June, we had seen a small smattering of cases, uh, about 12 uh, or so uh, by that point. And through the rest of June and the first part of July, you know, we had a few more cases come in. Um, but things have really started to take off over the past month. Um, this slide I updated last week, and I need to update it again now. Um, we are now up to 46 cases that have been seen um, at Children's Health Care Atlanta, with some of them still admitted. And over the last month, you know, we've seen, on average, about one new case per day. So MISC has certainly um, risen. Um, it has followed the trajectory of COVID in Georgia, uh, as you can imagine, with the spike uh, that we had in Georgia of acute cases back in July, we are seeing the similar spike uh, in MISC cases right now, uh, and it's been pretty steady uh, during the month of August so far. So we will see where this goes. Um, we are continuing to uh, see, as we you know, had mentioned in the past, a lot of cardiovascular involvement in these kids, and this is a study that was reported earlier this month, uh, came out of the CDC and an MMWR. This is of the first 570 cases of children with MISC that were reported nationwide, and about 87% of them had some sort of cardiac involvement uh, during MISC admission, uh, with many um, including you know, cardiac dysfunction or myocarditis uh, and coronary artery inflammation. So clearly uh, an important concern and issue uh, and, you know, these kids, when we see them, you know, in the hospital, we certainly are doing very supportive measures for them and giving the treatments. Um, all of them thus far have been able to be discharged home. Um, so that is good news. Um, but we are continuing to follow them for ongoing uh, sequelae, including uh, particularly cardiac sequelae. When they do leave the hospital, this group, we are restricting from sports and return to play due to the concerns of myocarditis in this population. So um, this group's pretty straightforward. We know that these kids are at high risk of having cardiac involvement. We have seen a lot of cardiac involvement, and then we are restricting them from sports. Uh, when they are coming to our clinics, we see them about two weeks and six weeks, checking EKGs and echo, looking for arrhythmias, cardiac function, and coronary involvement. Uh, and then about three months, those who had had any sort of cardiac involvement, uh, we are getting an MRI to really look for um, myocarditis uh, and stress tests as well if they're old enough to participate in that. And then we'll continue seeing them at six months and likely a year. Um, this is an evolving process. But now let's go on to acute COVID-19 and heart disease. So the MIC part is you know, we've learned a lot, we know a lot, and we have a pretty good handle of what we're doing, but still need to figure out the long-term implications of these children. But what about acute COVID-19 infection? What is their heart involvement? 
Well, uh, this is from a paper published in Heart Rhythm, and a lot of what we've learned here, I will tell you, has come from the adult world. Uh, during the acute involvement, you can certainly see heart involvement, uh, particularly in adults. We're not really seeing a lot of it in kids. Uh, we see a lot in the MIC picture, but during the acute COVID infection, not really a whole lot, but I also can't tell you that we're doing active surveillance looking for it. These kids do not get routine echoes, do not get routine cardiac labs. Um, but, you know, if they have any sort of symptoms or concerns, certainly we act accordingly. But there has been raised the concerns about what does the long-term uh, implications from acute COVID infection mean? You know, do they have myocarditis? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in this talk. Do they have certain arrhythmias? I can tell you we've seen in our clinic a number of kids this summer who uh, come in for sinus bradycardia, and it turns out they may have had COVID. Is that related to that? Very unclear, and we don't have great data on that, but we certainly have high levels of concern in the patient population. You know, this graphic down here goes a little bit over the thought process for acute and chronic heart inflammation. You know, with the acute episodes of cardiomyocyte injury, inf uh, myocardial inflammation, and microvascular ischemia. And then long-term, what do those mean? What do those lead to? Um, whether there's dysfunction in the heart or scarring of the heart. Um, and this can manifest in many ways, including arrhythmias uh, or cardiac dysfunction. But let's talk a little about myocarditis. Um, so myocarditis in general, um, you know, we think of this as an inflammatory disease of the heart muscle. Um, epidemiologically, it has a male predominance, although females can certainly be affected. Uh, and it's recognized primarily in young adults, um, but it can affect any age. The, uh, this is a schematic uh, from an article on myocarditis talking about you know, the pathogenesis. So we think of this usually as a child having some sort of viral infection, very often unrecognized, um, maybe had mild cold-like symptoms or other things. Uh, and then that can lead to some sort of immune response uh, from the body. And this includes the innate immune response, um, with cytokine production and from the cytokine storm-like picture, and an acquired response um, where different cells in the immune system um, and antibodies get activated. And this can lead to, you know, viral, viral clearance and hopefully resolution uh, of the viral infection and, and the myocardial injury, um, or it can lead to an ongoing uh, autoimmune myocarditis where the immune response remains active and there's ongoing injury. Um, in very severe cases, this can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, which is pretty severe cardiac injury um, that some kids can't necessarily recover from. Uh, in 2015, uh, there was a joint scientific statement uh, from the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, talking about different types of uh, cardiac conditions and what that means for eligibility for sports. Um, but in here, they gave a definition of what they were considering myocarditis for their recommendations. So I wanted to go over this briefly. So first, you think of it as a clinical syndrome that includes acute heart failure, chest pain, or myocarditis of less than three months duration. And things that you can see include uh, you know, elevations in troponin levels. You can see EKG features of cardiac ischemia. Um, you can see other arrhythmias, uh, such as AV block. There could be wall motion abnormalities on echo. Uh, there could be pericardial effusions on uh, echo echocardiogram or on MRIs. And then there could be MRI findings suggesting uh, myocarditis uh, based on certain characteristics we'll get to. So traditionally, when we've seen kids in the hospital, how have we diagnosed myocarditis? When are we starting to get suspicious? So the typical cases, we'll see a child, you know, come in, uh, often, you know, a teenager, uh, they can be any age, you know, with chest pain or with, um, you know, poor kind of heart failure symptoms. And we'll notice maybe some decreased function after cardiogram. We'll see their troponins elevated, their BNP can be elevated. And we'll grab an EKG and can see a variety of different findings. This is kind of a classic telltale finding 
um, showing that in the, the T waves in V6 that that left ventricle is not very happy. Uh, those T waves should not be downward like that. But the gold standard for diagnosing MRI, uh, is, for diagnosing myocarditis, is to obtain an MRI. Uh, and here in MRIs, we can see, you know, edema um, and some other features, which I'm not going to go into, uh, and, you know, evidence of inflammation, uh, you know, suggesting that there's an inflammatory process going on in the heart. And there are some criteria that have been well published for using MRI to provide a diagnosis of myocarditis. And traditionally, pre-COVID, when kids would come to the hospital, um, you know, sometimes it's not always completely clear. Is this really myocarditis? Is it not? What are we seeing? Um, we'll get MRIs during the inpatient setting to try to diagnose that. Um, we are not doing that right now um, for a variety of reasons, including um, prevention, uh, infection control. Um, but uh, long term, we will be getting them uh, to see if there's ongoing inflammation, as I mentioned in some of those prior cases. How do we treat it when we see a patient with myocarditis? You know, our, our care is primarily supportive. So if there's decreased heart function, we'll get some heart failure management, including, you know, diuretics or some other medicines. If they have any sort of arrhythmias, we'll treat that as needed. Uh, if they're, you know, having very poor cardiac output and poor perfusion, we'll use some vasoactive medication and, if necessary, uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, we will commonly use IVIG for the treatment of myocarditis, although, um, you know, to be you know, straightforward, the evidence that is not the strongest, but we do use it in, typically with a good response. Um, steroids we don't often use, and some would say they're contraindicated acute myocarditis. Uh, but these kids often get better and can go home. Um, but why then is this a big issue and why are we talking a lot about this? Well, uh, in a study about 10 years ago uh, of athletes who had a cardiovascular event as a cause of death, about 9% of them were found to have myocarditis. Uh, and sometimes this can be subclinical and the patients may not have necessarily had symptoms before that. In a recent study published uh, early this year of um, sudden death in children ages 1 to 17 years old. Uh, there are about 243 analyzed cases, and in those, uh, 19 of them had myocarditis or endocarditis. That was lumped together as one group. Um, there's some, uh, been some other publications coming out saying the number is somewhere around 5 to 7%, but somewhere around 5 to 10%, I think it's safe to say, of sudden death uh, in Children or athletes uh, can be attributed to myocarditis. And this is what we are trying to avoid. So what are the return to sports guidelines just regarding myocarditis in general? I want people to understand this before we get into some of the other post-COVID return to sports guidelines. So the current guidelines, um, this is from that joint paper from the ACC and AHA, uh, recommend basically restriction for at least three months and then to have an echocardiogram, 24-hour Holter monitoring, and an exercise stress test um, prior to being able to return to activity. Uh, at the time, that committee could not come to a consensus on whether um, you need to use MRI to show resolution of that inflammation uh, that I showed in the earlier slide. Uh, some people I believe that you don't need to show complete resolution as long as the other things are fine. And some people say, if there's still some inflammation, then there's still, you know, a, a nidus for some problems in the heart, uh, and you should still restrict. Um, so there's not complete consensus on that. I will tell you that our general practice, though, however, is to get these MRIs and see um, how these kids are doing before fully clearing them. So that's the concern for myocarditis. So let's talk now about guidelines for return to sports and what do we need to know after COVID. You will notice that um, uh, conspicuously absent from that so far, I talked really about heart disease in children during their acute COVID infection and their reasons because we really don't have any data on that. 
um, but we do have a little bit on some data in adults. So this is a study that was published uh, at the end of July, and it came out of Germany um, and got a lot of fanfare uh, in the cardiology community. Uh, and they were looking at adults who had, and I put in quotes, I, I would put in quotes here, recovered from COVID-19. Um, and they were getting MRIs on them to look for any evidence of heart involvement. So they had 100 adults, and they compared them to healthy controls. Median age was 49, um, so not you know necessarily elderly, but not um, young athletes either. About a third of these had been hospitalized, but two thirds were able to remain at home, which 18 of them had actually been asymptomatic and were tested due to contact exposures or, or other reasons. Uh, and there were a number of comorbidities, but they tried to control for that in their analysis. And they did this, these MRIs about two to three months after uh, patients had had COVID. Uh, and the results were quite surprising. They were able to show that about 78% had some level of cardiac involvement by MRI, with 60% having ongoing inflammation. Uh, and you know that's kind of that inflammation that I'd shown you earlier on the earlier slide. And it's varying degrees. Um, you know, some are very, very mild inflammation, not necessarily, you know, not really reaching the threshold of which we would call uh, meeting criteria for myocarditis, uh, but still not completely clean uh, MRIs either. So this study is in the forefront of a lot of people's minds, uh, you know, right now with the way recommendations are going and thoughts for sports season. And as you know, this has all gotten a lot of publicity uh, in the media. Um, so Eduardo Rodriguez, pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, is not pitching this year because he had COVID and had ongoing heart issues. And this started raising some eyebrows. The college sports world, this mom of a football player at Indiana University uh, made a long Facebook post really calling to attention um, the stress and anxiety of these issues of heart disease uh, in kids after having COVID um, and what this means for football players. You know, this led to lots of discussions about whether, um, you know, certain sports you know, should be played at colleges this fall, uh, including football. And closer to home, um, there's actually a patient from Georgia State uh, whose team is playing, but a freshman quarterback I uh, had to announce that he's not going to be able to play this year uh, because he had um, a heart condition following his COVID-19 infection. And this is, you know, obviously throughout, you know, many mainstream media as well, and doctors are starting to weigh in. The New York Times had an article just on how different doctors are weighing in on how colleges should proceed um, or not proceed, and it's not always clear as to what the best, best um, way forward is. Um, two prominent physicians who have weighed into this. Uh, this is one who's Kurt Daniels. He is actually an adult congenital cardiologist by training at Ohio State University, but he also heads up you know, their sports cardiology. Uh, and uh, he said in this interview that, you know, they had been doing MRIs on athletes at Ohio State this summer who tested positive for COVID. And they found, you know, some evidence of myocarditis in close to 15% of athletes who had the virus. Now, he did say this was very mild and none of them had any symptoms of myocarditis. Um, you know, didn't necessarily have, uh, you know, the Results for admission, like you know, I was going over earlier how some of these kids are presenting. Um, but when they're just looking and scanning, um, they're seeing things that they weren't expecting to see. Uh, on the other end is Mike Ackerman, who's also a very uh, well known uh, uh, pediatric cardiologist um, who spent a lot of time in you know, his life career work on sudden death and risk factors for uh, sudden death. Uh, and this is from an article uh, in Alabama that they titled How a Cardiologist May Save the College Football Season. I just found that uh, amusing title. 
but they said, you know, he used a soup analogy to explain how to weigh myocarditis, among other COVID-19 related issues and whether to play football this fall. And he said the conferences that canceled their seasons stirred myocarditis in as a primary ingredient to their soup and declared the soup tasted bad. And he advised the Big 12 and Conference USA leaders to take myocarditis out of that equation. And if they still felt that the soup tasted bad, then yes, go ahead. That's your reason to cancel the sport, the football season. Um, but he thought that while myocarditis is certainly a concern and is real, it's not something new. We've been dealing with myocarditis for years with other viral infections, it's not something that's unique to COVID. Um, but, you know, it is important to be aware of it and to be, you know, vigilant with it, especially those athletes who are having any sort of evidence of COVID you know, or of heart complications. So with that, we can talk about some of the protocols. So this is a protocol that was published by an exercise cardiology group um, from the American College of Cardiology. They actually published this back in May uh, in JAMA, um, but it's really become uh, a focal point uh, over the last you know, month or so as uh, schools are getting back into practicing uh, for the fall sports. Um, you know, clearly, the, you know, they've said the asymptomatic group, uh, you know, they, you know, if you're asymptomatic and just tested, you know, they should rest for a little bit, but they can go back uh, into playing as long as they don't have any symptoms. Um, for um, those who had significant symptoms or were hospitalized, they're recommending you know, troponin and cardiac studies and a pretty exhaustive workup. Um, but what really caught a lot of people's eyes, though, was this mild symptoms not hospitalized group. Um, so they were recommending that for competitive athletes who had just mild symptoms but weren't hospitalized, um, that all of those patients or all those athletes should get troponin, EKG, and echoes um, before resuming um, any sort of activity. That could be a lot of people um, and a lot of people who, you know, may not have any necessary symptoms. Uh, and they advise that they were just being cautious at this point as we learn more. High School Athletic Association uh, put out some athletic guidelines as well. Um, you know, they similarly said that if you had, you know, no symptoms, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, it's not as important, but Still, mild to moderate illness or no symptoms, uh, they still thought that all those uh, high school athletes should get a medical evaluation and possibly an EKG. Um, anyone who had severe illness, uh, they were recommending moving on towards cardiology uh, consults uh, and evaluations. And that's by hospitalized. And then clearly anyone with ongoing symptoms for any reason uh, you know, should get a full workup, including a cardiac workup. Uh, and then there's this, these other guidelines that are out there. And, and as I say, there's guidelines. This is just a proposal um, by a group of uh, about three pediatric cardiologists who saw the initial uh, American College of Cardiology guidelines and said, we don't think that the that proposed adult one really applies to kids for many reasons. Um, you know, kids are unlikely to get as severe disease as the adult. Um, and, you know, their hearts are just generally much healthier than adult hearts. Um, so they proposed a few modifications, uh, including that the asymptomatic child or the child who had mild symptoms, which they defined uh, as no fever or less than three days of symptoms, and that'll be important when we get to what our group is recommending, um, that those children should be cleared for participation. Um, but then two things you know, that I wanted to point out in this as well. So those are severe symptoms, and they, they identified that as anyone who's hospitalized, um, femoral cardiac testing certainly, and MISC should follow the myocarditis return to play guidelines, which is, you know, restrict for three months. Uh, we looked at this and thought, you know, we're not seeing really a whole lot of cardiac involvement in our acute COVID kids who are hospitalized. Certainly the MIC kids we are. So we didn't think that it was necessarily right to lump all hospitalized kids together. And I think there's the MIST group, which is their own bucket. We have clearly shown that they have cardiac involvement. 
And then there are kids who may have been hospitalized for acute COVID, you know, for either respiratory reasons or just dehydration um, or what have you. And I think clearly we have a lower threshold too, just in general, um, in pediatrics for admitting a patient to the hospital um, than we do in adults. Secondly, uh, when it comes to moderate symptoms, um, and that's kind of the prolonged fevers that, you know, just short of requiring hospitalization, uh, they made this distinction of 12 years of age. Uh, and the reason they made that is that they thought, you know, they rightly said that, you know, that the child playing, you know, rec soccer, seven-year-old, uh, is not quite the same as the, you know, high school player who's trying to get a Division One scholarship. Um, and so they put their cutoff at 12 years, that if you're under 12, you know, you can be cleared uh, even if you had moderate symptoms. If you're over 12, then you should probably get an EKG uh, just to look for any evidence of myocarditis or other cardiac problems before being cleared. And if that's abnormal, then you can get the cardiology workups necessary. Um, I highlighted this because when we put forth our protocols, we're going to go over here in a bit, uh, we thought that it really depends on what kind of question you're asking. I mean, I know this is called a return to sports webinar. And if the question is, is this child going to die suddenly, you know, on the sports field, then yeah, it's very rare for under 12 to do that. And it's going to be the older kid that you're much more worried about. Um, but if your question is, does this child who had COVID have any sort of heart involvement, period, um, and we're not so sure that the age cutoff makes sense there. Uh, you know, I, we certainly see, you know, five-year-olds in our clinic all the time whose parents had sudden death, um, and they want us to evaluate the five-year-old to see if there's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, because we want to know if there's heart disease there, um, even though we're not concerned about that child dying suddenly at five years old. So, You'll see in our guidelines, we do not have this age cutoff, and that's the reason, because we're thinking beyond more than just the uh, basketball court or athletic field. We're thinking uh, of just overall heart involvement in general. And then finally, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has put out a little bit of guidance regarding COVID uh, in athletes. Um, they don't have a fancy algorithm. They do have a statement that they think that all patients who have COVID-19 um, should be cleared for participation by their primary care physician. Um, so what have we taken all this to mean and what are we proposing? So this is our group's protocol that we've come up with. And I want to give two kind of caveats here uh, before I go through it. Um, and I will would like to mention that this, you know, has been widely distributed, but it is also available via this webinar as an attachment. So if you look in the handout section, uh, this protocol is there. Uh, but two things I want to make clear here. Uh, number one, um, all those protocols I've shown you and this protocol as well um, is not really based on any strong evidence. It's just too early and too soon um, to have good evidence as to what really is the level of risk uh, in kids. Um, you know, this protocol was made just based on our best understanding of prior experience with myocarditis and heart conditions, um, with knowing what our community is like and what our referral patterns are and, and what pediatricians will often refer in for, knowing that um, we have the ability to see a lot of kids. Um, uh, but then also kind of what is pragmatic and, you know, that we can't see all the children. I mean, not all children need to be held out of sports. Uh, and we know that a lot of families <clears throat> would be very, very upset um, if their child were held out of, held out, out of sports, uh, as you've seen in, probably in the news with some uh, parents of athletes whose seasons were canceled um, who are not very happy. Secondly, uh, I would say that this guideline is just a guideline. It is not a rule. It is not a, uh, you know, regulation. It is not a list of criteria for sending kids to a um, the bottom line is, at the end of the day, if any pediatrician feels, for whatever reason, that they want a child to have a cardiac evaluation before being cleared, or if the pediatrician's uncomfortable clearing them, um, and, and would rather them see cardiology, then by all means, you can send them to us. We will work them in, and we will see them, okay? 
So I'm not saying that we're not going to see any kids because they don't meet certain criteria. We just wanted to provide some sort of framework and foundation um, to give people a sense of who we think are the ones um, who really need to be sent in. Um, but uh, we certainly defer to pediatricians' judgment when deciding who to refer in. All right, that being said, I want to go through a few elements of this. Um, so first, we start in the top left with the hospitalized question. And you've heard me talk a little bit about hospitalized. Um, clearly, the child who's not hospitalized and whose symptoms are very mild or asymptomatic, you know, Chester for some other reason, um, but didn't really have, you know, a big fever, didn't really have any major symptoms. It was kind of a, almost like a small minor cold to them. Um, you know, we think that child doesn't really need a further cardiac evaluation and could be cleared um, for sports. Okay. Um, if then we look at, all right, if they were hospitalized and if they had cardiac involvement during their hospitalization or they had MISC, then you're going to go down um, this pathway um, to the part where they follow up with cardiology two weeks after discharge. Those are kids we want to see in our clinic and we want to know um, what their long-term implications are going to be of heart disease following their illness. Um, but if they didn't have cardiac involvement during hospitalization or didn't have MISC, uh, then we'll go for the normal physical, uh, you know, have a physical exam by their pediatrician uh, and an EKG. All right, so in this bucket here, you know, is all the kids who are hospitalized but did not have cardiac involvement, um, or, you know, they had an, an episode of COVID that was more than just very mild. Um, you know, we, those who had fever, which is about half of kids um, can have a fever during their illness um, or had some moderate symptoms should see their uh, pediatrician. And we're recommending an EKG for now. Uh, that EKG, some uh, pediatricians uh, I know have the capability to get that within their system. Others do not. And you can refer them in for an EKG only visit. Um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we can do an EKG only without um, uh, making the family incur a full visit and then can proceed accordingly after that. Um, you know, I, I have had some pediatricians ask, do we really want all these kids to be coming for EKGs? And the best way to respond to that is, you know, we're trying to be as consistent as we can with some of the other guidelines that are out there that do recommend an EKG. Um, you know, while at the same time, recognizing that as we learn more and as we see, uh, you know, you know what implications uh, these children are having or, or consequences they're having from their disease, uh, if we're not really seeing any kids with EKG findings, then we can later on modify this and not necessarily do the EKG. EKG is felt to be about 47% sensitive for myocarditis and not the best test. Uh, but if we see enough of these kids and we're still not seeing myocarditis in them, I think we can say that maybe we don't need the EKG. Uh, but we're not there yet, and so we wanted to err on the side of going ahead and getting it for now. Um, so, you know, the kids who have had, you know, uh, have any concerns or need to come see this, either those concerns that show up on the physical exam or the history or on their EKG or if, um, you know, there's any question or worry on the pediatrician's part will, you know, can come and see cardiology and get a full workup um, as needed. Uh, if that's normal, certainly we'll clear them for sports. And then if it's not, you know, we can be looking for myocarditis, so looking for other conditions and manage that accordingly. Okay. Okay. So I am going to um, turn this over right now, though, to Richard Lampier. And I asked Richard to join me today for this talk, uh, mainly because, you know, we are doing a lot on, um, you know, trying to have a primary prevention of sudden death on the, in these athletes. That is part of our big goal. I'm trying to find heart disease and trying to prevent these kids from having um, catastrophic events. This is like finding a needle in a haystack. You know, we're gonna try our best. We've got some good tools uh, to help try, help us try to find that, but we, we can't find everyone. Um, and, you know, certainly some point, some cases, and even just thinking outside of COVID, you know, there's certain kids who will never present or have any known risk factors come to light um, until they have any sort of event. 
So it's important to have a secondary prevention in place. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Richard. Thank you, Dr. Oster, and thanks everybody who's joined us today. So really, uh, what we're talking about is Project Save, Save stands for Sudden Cardiac Arrest, Vision, and Education. And so what we really want to talk about is the uh, emergency action plans that schools and athletic leagues have in place. And part of that, what we look at is really three different things. We look at the equipment. Do they have an AED? What type of AED is it? What, what does the pads look like? How do the pads work? How many do they have? Where are they placed? Do they have a portable one that's going to be on the sidelines? Do they have one in the gymnasium that you have to have a key to get into? And then we want to make sure there's a budget to replace pads and batteries. Next, we look at it is the building or the athletic venue that they're going to be participating in. Uh, we usually think that the, where they have games are well prepared, but where are they practicing at? And then the other thing we look at is what's the name of the building? It may be known as the old high school, or now it's a Mary Smith Elementary School. The people that have been there a long time know it as an old high school, but the new people know it as Mary Smith Elementary. Can you get into those buildings while they're practicing? And then how do you get EMS? Do they come in through the stairs? Do you have elevators to get up? And then the other thing we look at is EMS access points. Are there, is there any construction going on between your facility and the EMS station or the fire station. You have to let them know that GPS is not going to take them there. They have to make a turn here or there to get to the to the facility. And then when they get there, how do they get there? Are the gates locked? Is it easier to come through an access road down the back way to get to the practice field? So those are the things that we look at with the schools and the coaches and the athletic leagues. And then really what we're talking about is the a chain of survival. You know, we talk about identifying the emergency and a couple of things we talk about. One is, you know, you may have heard of Hank Gathers, the basketball player that went down in the NCAA. When he went down, they thought he was having a seizure. So we talk about seizure-like activity and also gasping respirations. We want to make sure we identify it and we always say it's a cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. And then how do you call 911? Do you do it from a landline that's going to give the address? Do you do it from a cell phone? And then how do you activate your internal first responders? We want to put together an internal first responder team of about 10 people. And then we teach CPR. We can do hands-only CPR. And then we also want to talk about early defibrillation. We want to get the AED there in less than three minutes and get the first shock off in less than three minutes. And then we talk about advanced care and transport. Where do you want to send that child to or that athlete to, or even the coach to? And then post-arrest care once, once we get them into the hospital. So we're really focusing on basic life support and the chain of survival. So this is a case summary that we, we had um, about five years ago. There's a, a female athlete that was playing volleyball she collapsed, and this is at a school that, that we consider a, a project safe, heart safe school. So they have an emergency action plan, they have a first responder team, and the other part we do is we make them do practice drills. So they practice four times a year to be ready for this moment, and we're going to show a video of what happened that night. Hold on, Richard. This plays when I try it. It might be because we're on the network here. Let me see if it'll play um, here. All right, Richard, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get this to play, even though I did test it on my computer. Right. Um, so 
We'll need to go to this next part though and you can walk people through it. Okay, so what happened is a 17 year old grabbed her chest and collapsed to the floor. Her dad had set up a tripod, it was senior night and this was at Loganville Christian Academy over in Loganville, Georgia. It was senior night, he'd set up a tripod and was filming it for possible recruiting purposes to get her a scholarship to play volleyball. The interesting thing about this is that she had complained about left shoulder pain the entire season. And so she, what the coach said, well, if you have pain in your shoulder, just take yourself out and we'll, until you start feeling better, and then you can get back in. But she hit the floor. The school thought there's a cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. Somebody said, call 911 and get the AED at 16 seconds. We were able to do a timeline from the video. The AED is right outside the, the gym door. School teacher went and grabbed it, brought it back, and started to work with it. Certified athletic trainer started CPR at 56 seconds. So I think that the real important part of this is going through this timeline. We have a trained professional that's prepared to start CPR. We talk about you know how long do we check for responsiveness? How long do we check for normal breathing? So we're talking about 10, 10 seconds to 15 seconds we're supposed to start compressions. It took almost a minute for her to realize exactly what was going on the shock to her system that, yeah, this is a cardiac arrest, I need to start compressions. The AED pads got applied at a minute and 43 seconds. This was a Zoll AED. Zoll AED saves lives, but they have a single pad system that's like a Z pad system because it has a CPR compression monitoring device built in. It will actually coach the person through the CPR but she'd never been trained on those practice on those pads. She'd always been trained on separate pads. So when she opened up that cellophane wrapper and this big thing fell out in front of her, she's like, oh my goodness, what is this? How am I gonna put this on? She actually put it on backwards. She put it on uh, victims high left and low right instead of victims high right, low left. It still worked. So the she got defibrillated at two minutes and 11 seconds. So again, what happened? Why did it take almost a minute and a half to have that first shot delivered after the AED got there? And when we talked to Julie Sermon, the lady who actually was working with the AED, she said when the AED told her to press the shock button, she froze, she panicked. She said, here's this thing wants me to shock this 17 year old girl whose mom and dad is crying and praying over top of her. What is it gonna do to her? On the third time that the AED told her to press the shock button, the athletic trainer pointed at her and said, press that shock button. And when she did, it saved her life. So CPR in return to spontaneous circulation happened about three minutes and 30 seconds. The ambulance got there at 10 minutes. So that's one of the things that we've really you know, emphasized is that if you're waiting on EMS, it's too late. And so this school, and, and I'm happy to report that Claire, uh, Proper, who was a volleyball player, uh, graduated from the University of Georgia in May and also got married this, this summer on May 30th. She had her wedding. Their first date was this volleyball game. So, um, you know, when things are done right, even, you know, with a well practiced team, they practice four times a year. Now, Loganville Christian Academy practices their emergency cardiac drill once a month. So how are we doing as Project Save? We have over 1,450 schools. And then we have 128 lives saved, 65 are children, 63 are adults. Two of the adults have been the school nurse. They literally taught their coworkers to save their life. So if anybody wants more information about Project Save, you can reach out to us and it's choa.org slash Project Save for my contact information. This is a program that's provided by Children's Health Care of Atlanta at, at no charge to the schools or athletic leagues, including CPR training and, and uh, course completion cards are included with that. But we'd be happy to, to do a site assessment or go, any, go over any of the schools or athletic leagues that you are involved with. Be happy to do that. Great, thank you very much, Richard. So in conclusion, before we get to some questions, 
you know, as we said, COVID-19 still very prevalent. We're seeing a lot of cases in MIC. We're still seeing a lot of cases uh, of COVID. Uh, the last numbers I checked, there were more than 20,000 cases uh, of COVID-19 in children in Georgia uh, thus far. Uh, it's varying degrees of involvement, of heart involvement, you know, certainly a lot in um, the uh, uh, MIC case in the acute COVID, we're still learning. Um, but if you do have heart involvement, that, that does portend some level of risk with activity. Uh, and so we're trying to, you know, have primary prevention and prevent these kids from having uh, these sudden cardiac events. Um, but they can occur and they do occur even separate from COVID. And so the secondary prevention with Project SAVE uh, and, and being able to give by standard CPR is very important. So I do see a few questions, which I'm going ahead to take. If you have any, please type them into that chat box. Um, and at the end, um, I'll unmute everyone in case anyone on the phone who's unable to join us uh, would like to also um, ask some questions. So the first question I see here is for EKG recommendations, would one be recommended for any child who had less than three days of symptoms but had a fever? And the fever is present for even just one day, those kids would all be recommended to get an EKG. Uh, so as I said, currently our guidelines, you know, it's, it's hard to say where the distinction is between what's mild and what's moderate. Um, since others have said it will include fever uh, to kind of take the child out of the mild uh, category, um, you know, have a higher level of suspicion in those kids, we're going by that for now. But as I said, we're going to be learning as we go. And if we see that those EKGs turn out to just be, you know, a waste of time without finding anything, then that recommendation may change. Um, but for now, uh, we'd rather be safe than sorry. And EKG is a rather benign uh, and cheap test to get. Um, our question is, what would this be recorded? This is being recorded. Uh, if a child has cough for four days, fever for one day, they need to be follow up. Yes, yeah, so they would see the pediatrician uh, and get an EKG. Um, there's a question here. We've been told in a Choa Town Hall that all positive patients, regardless of symptoms, should refrain from sports for two weeks. Is that from data diagnosis? Is that from resolution of their symptoms? Is it even true? What would be the bare minimum? So there's two things to consider when allowing kids to return to sports um, and return to activity. So the first is obviously just the infection control risk. We don't want children who um, recently had a COVID infection to be around uh, other players uh, on the team. So current CDC guidelines say that uh, 10 days after the onset of symptoms, um, you can re be removed from isolation um, as long as you have uh, you know, resolution of the fever and improvement um, in the symptoms. Uh, repeat testing is not needed. So that's the 10 days part. Um, but when can you go back to activity? Uh, that I've seen all over the board. Um, you know, I've seen you know, 10 day, you know, the, some people say the same timeline just for consistency sake, and that's kind of what we've been saying. Someone said, well, wait two weeks till after they have the infection, um, just because we don't know what the cardiac um, implications are. I think that's a reasonable approach as well. Uh, you know. What we kind of been saying is, you know, it's similar to if you've had other viral illnesses, you don't want to go and ramp up activity right away, right? If you had a certain viral infection, um, it's important to kind of ease back into activity, especially even out of it you know, for about 10 days, uh, which is really important for our competitive athletes um, so they don't go right back into full bore activity. So that's kind of a moving target, but I think that's a case by case, it's user judgment type of question. Um, do you think we need to go through our records to try to review each of our our known COVID cases to see if they need to get the EKG? Uh, that's an interesting question, um, and I think that'll depend on what people's capability is and what they're seeing. Uh, you know, I would say certainly if that child is, you know, from the first aspect of it, the sports clearance aspect of that child's coming for sports clearance, hopefully uh, that will be a good time to refer them to the EKG. Um, if you're worried about any sort of cardiac uh, evaluation, um, you know, you've you know, probably been looking for that a little bit just when you see these kids. 
uh, seeing if they have any other symptoms uh, related to their COVID infection. Uh, but you know, I wouldn't say that right now, uh, given how much we don't know, that I would you know, say that you need to make a huge effort to go and find everyone, but I guess that depends on kind of your level of suspicion and concern for these kids. So this is just a framework. This is our starting point. We're learning as we go, and we'll see. Certainly, if I said we know that every case has problems, um, you know, then I would say, all right, go back and look at it. You know, for instance, the MIC cases, we know that a couple of those kids have not made it to cardiology follow-up for whatever reason, and we're trying to be very active about those kids to get them in um, just because we know that they can have cardiac sequelae. Uh, for the acute COVID ones and kids, um, you know, I would say, you know, it's not as, you know, pressing necessarily to do it, um, uh, but for certain populations and certain types of the kids, it might be more important. Um, a lot of these kids are not coming for a physical exam. They're mild, get tested on their own with an order from telemedicine, trying to keep them home to prevent the spread. All these patients need to be brought in for physical exam. Um, part of the bottom was. Um, hold on. What are we looking for in an patient without cardiovascular symptoms? BP, heart rate, murmur. Is that it? Okay. Uh, so, what types of things are we looking for? And oh, and there was a question: Can you do telemedicine if no chest pain and only mild symptoms? All right, so a lot to unwrap there, so let me try to take that piece by piece. Uh, first, most importantly, you know, I think th I, I would not bring a child in to the office for these clearances or even think about sports clearance, all right, uh, until a child, you know, is out of the infectious stage, all right? I, I would think it's perfectly okay to wait, and that's that 10 days you know, from the CDC guidelines, we said that 10 days after onset of symptoms or from their testing if they were asymptomatic um, before uh, they should be in any sort of clinics. And we certainly have that policy in our own cardiology clinics. We do not bring anyone in um, who is still in what is considered the infectious period, whether that be the child or the parent uh, who's coming with them. Um, so that's the first question. You know, things that we're looking for, this is very similar to what you've all already been doing for sports clearance. Um, you know, asking about chest pain, palpitation, syncope, uh, asking about family history, um, those sorts of things. Um, you know, blood pressure, I don't think of as that important for a sports clearance. You know, it's certainly just standard ongoing uh, health maintenance, sure, but I don't think it's that important for sports clearance. So um, that is okay. Um, heart rate. Uh, you know, as I said, we've seen some kids with a low heart rate. I don't know exactly what that means. So I'm not sure heart rate, though, is really going to put you one way or another. Murmur. Um, clearly, you know, if you have a murmur, we'll want to uh, know about it, but you've been hopefully examining these kids all the time. Uh, for this kind of subacute of clinical myocarditis, we're not really seeing new murmurs. That's not really what we're finding. You know, certainly if they're pretty bad heart function and they have you know, a, a gallop on exam or something else, uh, you know, we'd want to know that and be looking for that. But those kids will probably also have some other sort of symptoms, right? So ongoing fatigue or, you know, poor appetite or you know, vomiting or respiratory problems, something like that. So, you know, can you do a lot of this with a telemedicine visit? I would say probably you can. Um, you know, if your practice is not up and seeing patients, can you do some of this telemedicine wise? Uh, I think you probably can. And then the ones you're worried about, um, or if they need an EKG, um, you can send them into us and we can do that. As far as timing of COVID and EKG or any specification, I had a patient I'm normally EKG during first couple of days or illness does it need to be repeated? Uh, the short answer to that one is I don't know. Um, you know, certainly if they, you know, the two questions here is the acute infection and acute period, you know, it's good to, you know, I'm glad you were looking for some sort of cardiac involvement then. So they normally keep you then are certainly uh, helpful. Um, the things we're looking for though is long standing and further on uh, acute problems. For now, I would say if you have that one normally KG and no new symptoms have 
arisen though, I think it's probably fine uh, for that child. But if there's any concern or any other things that come up, uh, then don't hesitate to get another EKG or, or send them in. Um, given how active some kids are, even though not in organized sports, should we be testing kids even though they aren't getting a sports clearance, even if young enough that don't require the physical for school population? Yes, yeah, so this kind of gets to the question uh, that I posed earlier that, you know, some of the other you know, proposed pediatric guidelines have a 12 year cutoff. Um, but a, uh, this gets to the bigger question, are we really talking about, are we worried about our child dying suddenly on sports um, field? Um, or do we really want to know what heart conditions they may have? So, um, you know, even young kids, I personally want to know whether they have heart involvement going on. Um, and if we can find that in an easy and pragmatic fashion, um, that may be useful to do. Uh, I will tell you that on the ACC protocol, though, when they had a webinar on the adult one when that came out, uh, someone asked them to define competitive sports, and I think it pretty came pretty clear that no one has a uh, agreed upon definition of what means competitive sports. Because um, even if you're not, you know, as you're, as you're pointing out here, you know, training for the Olympics, um, you still could be pushing yourself hard, um, and some kids will push themselves hard even at times. Uh, okay. We are almost out of time, but I will try to answer these last couple of questions. Uh, someone had a question about safety of COVID vaccine. Uh, I don't know anything about that yet. All that I can tell you for sure that I do know is that uh, the people who are working on vaccine development and vaccine testing are well aware of some of the long-term sequelae, like including MISC. And so that is on their radar when testing for the safety of a vaccine. Um, but I think it's too soon to tell uh, where we stand with that. Um, but I do feel confident people are looking into that. Um, if a child comes in for a well check and identifies having COVID infection three months prior, do they still need an EKG this far out from COVID infection? That's an excellent question. Um, I would leave that to your discretion for right now, and then, and you can see, you know, certainly examine the kids, see how they're doing, um, and you know, if there's any concern that there could be, you know, if that child's illness was more than just a very mild or asymptomatic case, um, I think it would be, you know, reasonable to get an EKG. But I also don't think anyone would fault you for not getting it. And then optimal time to get an EKG for the child who fits criteria, first day out of infectious period too soon. Uh, no, I don't think that's too soon. Uh, I think that's okay once they're out of the infectious period. Uh, we can check and see because if they're going to want to be getting back into sports and into activity, um, you know, the, the, we want to make sure that they have uh, at least some sort of evaluation. Um, and then a the big thing to keep in mind is if, you know, when people start exercising or doing anything, if anything comes up, if they are feeling chest pain or feeling palpitations, if they're, you know, um, don't feel like they had the energy they used to, but otherwise feel fine when they're at rest, uh, but they're not able to push themselves, then that should be, you know, raising some red flags. And, you know, you can always stop um, and go back for more evaluation um, if any concerns come up. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Um, for your questions um, and for your attention today. Um, hopefully, we've given some guidance here. Um, as I said, you know, we're, we're here to work with you. Um, if you have any concerns or questions, you can send kids in. You can email us questions. Um, and uh, if we do make changes in the future, um, we'll try to get that out so that people know um, as we all learn more together. Thank you.